So today I'd like to talk about um, some best practices for securing your, your virtual environments when you're first spinning things up and you're first creating things. We've, um, you know, we've noticed in the past um, year or so, when we, um, we had quite a few exploits with Log4j and we were doing um, scanning vulnerability of all of our, all of our, um, all of our project spaces inside of OpenStack for um, our Arbutus cloud. And we had a few instances where we were able, not able to get a hold of the researchers, um, the researchers that were in charge of the project space and maybe the VMs that they had spun up had left or they had forgotten their private keys or their passwords. They just couldn't get into these machines anymore. And so we had problems with uh, essentially zombie machines that were not able to be taken down properly. And so there, there was a potential for, you know, loss of, of research um, data and research, uh, you know, just research work in, in general. So today, um, I'd like to discuss um, how to work with SSH keys for the first time in your login and how to add um, additional keys to your, to your virtual machine inside your project space. Uh, just good practices for securing your, your, your private keys so that they're not lost. Then we'll um, dive into the VM, uh, creating a VM and basically the end of a zombie virtual machine is what I like to call it. So we'll go along and we will set up automatic updates, email notifications, and just really good practices on making sure that uh, your VM unattended will make sure that the security patches are updated uh, at, a regular, at a regular interval. And then once that is all done, we'll get a little bit into um, the zero trust model for cloud infrastructure, containers, uh, Kubernetes, Docker, um, you know, vulnerabilities and attack vectors that, that can happen inside of containers under various areas. And then um, I would like to demo at the end uh, or talk about a, a full cycle, life cycle container security application called um, uh, New Vector. And this is a, this is a fairly new um, offering that, that's been around for about a year. It's still in its preview phase. It's not official, um, but I've been playing with it. And I think there's a lot of potential for, for fixing um, some of the longstanding security and uh, other kinds of uh, life cycle issues with, with uh, containers, short-lived containers, especially. So the first thing we'd like to do is I'd like to show you um, best practices on SSH keys. So when you first log in, uh, you've created your VM, you've got your private key, and everything is great. But then you want to go a step further and uh, create a couple more keys for, for users that might also be using uh, your, your VM that you've created. So I'm assuming if you're the project owner, you, you create the VMs, or if um, you've delegated some of your researchers to do this work for you, um, these are some of the stack tasks that they're going to want to follow. And so for now, so what I'll do is I'll jump over to a virtual machine, or actually I will jump over to OpenStack first. And here we are, and I will spin up the machine, a brand new instance right away, really quickly here, and show you the best practices of what you would do with the private key. So let's call this um, Westgrid demo two. And we can call it the same. And we'll check our source, and we'll go with um, we'll go with Ubuntu, and the flavor. We'll just go with uh, something small. Uh, and the networks is the networks because there's a few networks in this in this test. Well, you know, you would just usually get one, um, but we'll grab the one that I know that's for this project space. Um, you can ignore that part and this part, and here's the part, the key pair. So I've got two key pairs already, but I'm gonna generate a new key pair. We'll call this N demo two, and the key type SSH. Now this is, when you create the key pair, this, this is the important, like this, this private key is the key that you will need to get access to, um, to your VM. And this is a one-time thing, once this is done, um, you are not able to go back in and rekey your VM. You would have to, if you lost this key, you would have to destroy your VM and recreate the VM from scratch. So that's why it's really important. You save this VM, this, this private key for your VM, 
And also, it's also important that you create other keys for your other users so that um, there's redundancy. So I'm going to copy that to the clipboard notepad and I'll just paste that in there. And then you want to save this. It's really important um, when, um, when you're saving this key. You know, I use a, um, I use KeePass XC. Um, that is, you know, that, that, that's uh, something that I use to store all of my passwords. And um, it's just good practice to have that in a place that's, that's secure. I have, it, I, it, it, the good thing about KeePass is it, supports, it secures all of, your, all of your passwords in a secure database that's encrypted. And then you can put that in a number of locations, including the cloud and your own private space. Okay, so that's done. Oh, I think I selected it. Yep, I got that. It's good. It's good. Okay, so we're just going to launch the machine really quickly. And it doesn't take long. And while that's uh, spinning up, I'm just going to associate a floating IP to it so I can connect to it. So that's, we'll just assume that's built. And so the first time login, I will, um, here, pull up my cheat sheet quickly, make things fast. So now I'm on the server for the first time. And the first thing you want to run, um, you're going to see if you have um, a key that's already generated for this, this machine. Because the private key that you've set up in the OpenStack isn't the one that's going to be for the user itself on this end. So the first thing I do is run this command here. Oops. Sorry, guys. And if there's something there, it would, but usually you would get an error that it's not there, um, that this public key is not there. And so what you would do is you would create the new public key. So I'm just gonna recreate a new key right now. And at this point here, it's gonna ask you where you wanna save it. It already exists, you wanna overwrite it. You, you would say no, because you wouldn't get this error. Um, and now the, the important, the passphrase, if you, this, um, if, this key is going to be used um, for an automated process um, where you're not going to need your, the password could be a problem. Um, then you don't necessarily need to end one here, but if it's just for a regular user, it's generally a good idea to always enter a password um, for your passphrase. Um, I'm going to use, I'm not going to enter one just for this demo. And now you have, now you have your key. So the next step you want to do is if, um, if you want other users to access the machine besides yourself, and how do you do that? So if you're just a regular user on your own machine and say you want uh, your work machine to be able to connect to this machine to this, to this user. So I would open up, um, my, you know, my local terminal, my local terminal for the, for this example, I'm using um, in windows here. And so I would go to my SSH directory and assuming if you, you have a key created, if you didn't have a key created yet, you do the same thing I did before where you create the key. And so this, this is important, the public key. So you have your ID uh, public key. So if you were look inside that, you have this key here. So if you were just copy that key, 
and put it inside the file authorize key. If you put that there, this is the this is the default. This is one I've already added. And the nice thing about this is that you just go right to yeah, I'm at the end. Yeah, sorry about that. So you don't um, you you don't need any spaces. You just go right to the to the next line. I think that did it. Yeah. So now if I was to SSH, there we go. Okay, so that's the key. You wanna make sure everything is one line. So that is one little the issue you've got to look for. So now I can connect directly to this machine um, from my own, my own workstation with no issues at all using, using my own key from my own workstation. And so you could do that with any number of users. So if you were to add a user um, on, on the server, and then create a key uh, for that user on that server. And then inside of, so for example, I've created one other user here. I call, I call him Bam Bam Bigelow. And inside, his fold, inside this folder, oops, you could see, you could see also uh, the authorized keys. And so for that user in the authorized keys, you'd put the same um, private key or public key that your workstation has inside of there. And you could, you could connect as another user. So the idea is here, you wanna create, um, you wanna create a few users that might access the system that are not root level. Um, and then you have sort of control over your virtual environment. You have multiple users. Um, they're not using passwords and, and, it's, and it's secure. Now that's just that's just one level of um, that's just one level of that. You also have here in the networking side of things. You, we've also got um, another layer, so people can't just connect to um, they just can't connect to um, this this virtual machine without actually first um, getting in here and in your default security rules, adding SSH rules for your own IPs. And this is also a really good practice to not open up SSH to the world is just to lock it down to the machines that are gonna be connecting to that if, if it's possible. And you can you know, obviously um, have subnets, you can have uh, ranges, not just one single static IP. So if your workspace was all, you, know, you could do a slash 24. So once that's done, um, you're good with that. And we can go, we can go, um, Once you have that done, um, at that point, you've got your keys saved and you, we've tested it out. And now, um, now, it's time to, now it's time to lock down the machine in terms of updates. So the next step here is we wanna make sure that we've set up on, unintended upgrades. So the first thing you do when you log into this machine is you do an apt update and an upgrade. And it's gonna ask if you wanna continue. And you, you would definitely say yes to that. And then you would do at that, after you were done that, you might wanna reboot. Um, you might, and, and do it a few more times until there's no more packages. And then from there, you would install the unattended upgrades and the notifier commons. And then you would check to see if everything is running. Once that's, uh, once that's all up and done, the next point, the next step is to change some of the unattended upgrade rules and as well add um, some blacklists for packages that you don't necessarily want to be touched during automatic updates. Um, you know, there's a few examples there. As well, um, we'll go into setting up an automated uh, email so that you're, you're getting notifications when these things are happening, when there's updates happening as well. Um, get into the... Um, the email setup for that. So basically your, your, your VM, when you first create it, isn't gonna have any kind of an MTA to send emails out. So that's, that's one thing you wanna, you wanna make sure that you set that up too. And that's, uh, that's all done here. Um, and so we'll do that right now quickly. So I'll just show you an example. What I'll do here is I'm just gonna make this a little bit uh, smaller so everybody can see both. And I have a little cheat sheet here to just make things go a little bit quicker. So, you know, you'd run, uh, oops. 
get out his root there. So sudo apt update. Upgrade. Oh, look, I've got something. Okay, yes. Okay, and then from there, um, we'd uh, we do the updates. We'd uh, install the uh, the unintended upgrades, um, but I've already got it installed, as well as the second one. Um, and then what we would do is we would enter into um, the the rules for this for this upgrade. So I'll do that quickly now, and I'll show you what I have. I've already set this up, so I'll, I'll just explain this a little bit. So I'll go to the top. And so these are the distros um, that the security, um, basically the security packages that you want to be uh, checking. Um, and so anything with a double line that's commented out. So that just gives you some information on what's, uh, what's not going to be happening. Go back, ports, updates, and proposed. Then you have the blacklist. Um, I have here, I have uh, a few applications that I've decided that I don't want to update. You can also put wildcards. It shows you examples how to do the wildcards. And then um, that uh, that the dev release that's that's automatically there. And then we'll go down here the uh, the upgrades. So then you want you want these are generally commented out by default. So you want to comment this, um, and then you would enter your email address uh, that you want the the notification notification notifications to go to. The mail report on change any kind of changes you can you know you can do on error only. Um, you know, on change is good. And then you have the reboot section. Now this area here is something you might want to talk with your researchers about. If um, you want to set up automatic reboots with updates, and this can happen um, right away as soon as there's an update, or it can happen at a scheduled time. Um, it can also be set up so that it can kick the users off. So there, if there's active users on the machine at the time that there is updates being done, you can set this to either reboot yes or no with the users online. Um, in this case, I put true um, because I also set uh, this update to happen at 4 a.m. So the chances of users maybe being on that um, is, is a lot less. So of course, you'd want to coordinate with, with everybody using your, your, your VMs on, on how to set that up. And that, that's it for that file. Oops. And then you'd want to um, you'd want to check it, check this file here uh, is the next file. Now this is um, if you're not running Ubuntu oops, if you're not running Ubuntu twenty, um, this file won't exist. And this basically sets everything to check. If the, by default it's zero, and you it sets to one. So how you set that if this file doesn't exist in Ubuntu twenty, you'd run um, you'd run this command here. And it, what it does is it just it, it does a it it gives you the automated thing so it lets you know what do you want to do you're going to update yes and you say yes and then it, it creates that file for you and then you and then you don't have to uh, edit that file so then the next thing you want to do is um set up the mail out and so the first time you run um this i'll show you the mail command here for an example if you were to run this command and you didn't have mail utils installed, it's just, it's going to fail. Um, and in this case, I do have it already installed, but how to install that, um, you just you just install uh, mail install. So sudo apt install mail utils. And it would, uh, it would, it would install, and then you could run that, uh, you could run this, this command here to test it out. And everything goes well, you won't get an error. 
And then uh, if you check your, your mail, uh, your mail inbox where you sent it to, you should get an email with um, that's the bot, that's the subject, and that's the bot, the subject, and then the body. And um, let's see here. Do I have it? There it is. You can see I got the email in my inbox. So then you know it's working. So that means now you're going to get on a you're going to get updates on what's going on for your for your VM uh, in terms of updates. Now, um, it's uh, it's highly recommended that you do this because you know if you're away for any amount of time, this um, you know, uh, or if for some reason uh, you're busy, it's it's really important that that these security updates are done on on a, on a regular basis. And I know sometimes we just forget to do these things, so it's really good practice to try to set this up when you first build your VM out. And if everything goes well, you're good. So um, next, I'd like to talk a little bit about zero trust. Um, zero trust is definitely not uh, is definitely not a new concept. It, it's been around um, since 2009, 2010. It was developed. Um, you know, it was coined and sort of the model was thought of and worked on in uh, the Forest Research Labs um, with uh, John Kinderberg or Kindervag. And um, it's a way of thinking. It's not. Um, it's not a technology or architecture, and it's about. Um, it's about implicit trust, and the difference between implicit trust and explicit trust. With implicit trust, anyone, anyone inside can access anything. Uh, data can be used, copy or moved anywhere, and it's static manual control. So it's always done by hand, and it's it's not automatic, and so. Yeah, in, implicit implicit trust is, is not something um, is not something that works with the zero trust model. With explicit trust, um, access is only granted only what you need, and it's ex and what is explicitly permitted. Um, uses is also controlled and revoked um, when needed, automatically, and continuous monitoring with um, an adaptive control controls are put in place for for your space. So the core, um, the core principles uh, of zero, zero trust are connecting from uh, a particular network must not determine which services you can access. Access to services is granted based on context, what we know about you and your device. And all access to services must be authenticated, authorized, and encrypted. Now, um, to dive back, about the zero trust model not being something that's um, very new. I know from firsthand, um, zero trust before I knew zero trust in the computer world, um, when I was working on another area out on campus, I was involved with clinical trials for, for more than almost 20 years. And we dealt with auditors coming in from the FDA, FDA auditors for phase one, two, and three uh, MS clinical trials. And when they came in, uh, our network and our computer infrastructure was, you know, it was very important that we had things locked down in ways that a, a user couldn't um, fake data, uh, a researcher or a, 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 a image, uh, an image uh, analysis person couldn't um, put in things by mistake. And so we slowly created safeguards to prevent um, access or not access, but prevent um, um, basically what we called it as backdating. And that's the thing that, you know, it happens. And so we built this, uh, we built the software around everything so that you had to have checkpoints all the way. So when the system administrators logged in uh, for the first time of the day, there was firewall checks, firewall rules that needed to be checked. There was logs that needed to be checked. There was a lot of processes during the day that needed to be checked. And they didn't necessarily get done if you weren't constantly reminded and made to do them without so you couldn't get your work done without doing those and that was called a bug me software program we created and so it basically it, it just it just monitored you constantly let you know via emails saying have you done this have you done this and if if you didn't do it after a certain point during the day the, the your manager would get an email saying hey you know ken didn't uh he didn't check the firewall rules you, can you verify that he's checked the firewall rules and signed off and that has to happen every day and if we didn't do this and the auditors came in and they looked at 
uh, any of our logs that we had done before we switched to this model on paper. And if there was anything missing, there was questions. And that's where it got into really scary areas because when you're underneath uh, an audit, sometimes there's a lot of pressure and you could, you could say something you're not supposed to say, you could do something you're not supposed to do. And when in that, in that scenario, um, when the trust is broken, it's over. Um, you're done and they'll that that's it for you and that can cost a lot of money so with a zero trust um with a zero trust model that you eliminate that possibility completely because there's all these checks and guards and it's it's completely explicit trust all the way through so you it really does save the day it seems like a lot of work but it, it does work so that leads us to containers and the vulnerabilities and the vectors that you can have within containers. Con containers are a very new thing. Um, they are short-lived. They, compared to regular virtual machines, uh, the container can cause, if a container causes damage and gets killed after, after a short while, uh, there's, there's, there's no possibility to leave uh, a trace. And, um, and the security solution might not have any aware awareness of that container lifecycle or what happened. So if the security solution cannot scale fast enough to keep up with uh, the applications that you're designing inside of the containers, those applications are left unprotected and at, at the most critical moments. And um, the most important benefit of the container technology brings is the fact that um, the easiness of deployment and scale. So deploying containers securely should not, um, it shouldn't be a burden for uh, your programmers, for your DevOps, if, it, if, if um, container security was a burden for everybody using it, no one's going to want to use it. And so that's, that's something that, um, that needed to be addressed with, um, with that. So you also have um, overstuffed, uh, overstuffed containers. So you'll get, um, you'll, get, um, you'll get containers that you might not know what's inside them. You might have downloaded it off the net. Um, and you've just you've just spun it up, and and there's will no there's really no way to to see what's inside that container quickly, and that and that's um th that's a thing. So um, that's a lack of visibility, um, not being able to see inside the containers uh, connections and behaviors. So um, that leads to chaos, uh, constant change. Uh, containers are starting updating. It's it's just it's it can be a real problem. And, and then container sprawl is also um, another thing. So with increased uh, east-west traffic, um, the containers um, are not able, they're not able to secure, they're not able to be secure. And there's no way to secure a container um, with east-west east -west traffic in the traditional sense. And when I mean by east-west traffic, that's generally thought of um, traffic within a data center. And uh, there's north-south and north-south traffic is from the data center to the internet. And, but now we have a situation with public cloud. We have, we have uh, east-west traffic that is happening between data centers on the internet, in cloud. And so that's a whole new northwest, east, it's, it's everywhere. And so what happens then, um, you can imagine that the east-west traffic between the data centers, when there are private networks or hybrid public clouds, not all the traffic between data centers um, is, uh, is, is monitored. And this might even occur um, frequently inside of containers. So since it's so easy to, to deploy and just to destroy containers um, based on available resources, east-west traffic um, is, a, is a very big vulnerable point. And then, um, the integrity and authenticity of, of your containers. Um, security teams can't, uh, can't really dive deep into the containers that are being built um, because it slows down DevOps. And you, know, you wanna have basically a scenario where uh, growth um, is not sacrificing security. And so that, that's something to think about as well. And so, um, yeah, I, I about a, about three or four months ago, I started working uh, working to look for uh, a solution that might address um, container security, and I did, I uh, stumbled upon this this uh, piece of software called New Vector, 
and it um, it addresses it addresses all of uh, all of these things. Um, it provides uh, it provides layered runtime protection of your containers. It checks for violations outside of normal behavior. So when you build up a container a container that um, is just a web a web app and it's doing something that's not supposed to this this software is monitoring what it's supposed to be doing constantly. Uh, it checks for application threats. It checks for vulnerabilities. It checks checks for prev, pri, priv, uh, privilege escalations um, before the attacks that happen. So it detects them on the fly, and uh, it also does uh, behavioral learning across your um, your project space, your container project space. And this is this is all done in real time. So the nice thing about um, New Vector is that it runs inside of a container itself. It does not require an agent. Um, it's not embedded into container images that you create. And it doesn't have any application coded outside of, of itself needed. So you don't need to develop, you don't need to add anything to your application for this to be useful. And this is all, um, this is all done inside um, one container uh, that provides both the manager and the controller for your cluster. Uh, the enforcer container is deployed uh, on every host. Um, so that's, uh, so say you have a master node. Um, so say, for example, you're using Kubernetes and you have a master node and then you have a bunch of worker nodes. And so um, the enforcer, the enforcer container is deployed across all of your, all of your, your nodes. And it's constantly inspecting, it's protecting all your containers, all the network and the application, application behaviors. Um, the nice thing about New Vector too is that it deploys on um, on many um, orchestration tools. So it works with Docker, it works with Kubernetes, it works with Amazon EC2, uh, it, EC2 Container Services. It works with Red Hat OpenShift, and it works with Rancher. Um, it integrates seamlessly. It's also compatible with other platforms. So that's just not its main list. For example, I, I was able to install this on, um, on Ubuntu in OpenStack with no issues at all. Uh, and it, it, it worked, um, it worked quite well. It also is, um, so once the, once the new vector containers are deployed, they'll discover and map all your other containers. Um, and the network behavior and the security stack is automatically created and isolates each application no matter what they are running. So for example, say you have a container um, called Node3 um, that has no business connecting to a WordPress container. Um, if that was to happen, New Vector would, um, would basically uh, signal a violation alert and you would see that in on the dashboard some, that something is going on that shouldn't be happening. So, um, it, and it's able to detect uh, violations within the host, between hosts, and between clouds, um, depending on how you how you set it up. So with that, I have a working demo I can show you. I'll go back here, and I'm going to jump over to my other workspace. And you can see here, I have um, I have my uh, my 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 master node and my my two worker nodes, and this is all this is all done in Kubernetes. I built this up uh, about uh, a couple months ago, and um, yeah, that's uh, that's the public IP for the whole for the uh, the um, the new vector, and this is it here. So let me log in. I typed the wrong password. Try again, sorry guys.
There we go. Okay. So in this case, I only have two nodes. I only have uh, two nodes running. I have the, the third node that isn't um, set up to this. I was actually um, this morning trying to see if I could break a few things and I wanted to, uh, I was playing around with this. But the great thing is, is that we have what we want. So um, with, the, with the dashboard, you get a quick overview of what's going on between your containers. You'll have, uh, you can set up automatic uh, scanning of your entire network. Um, and it gives you, uh, it just basically gives you a real quick overview. If we go to nodes, so you can see I have my master node and my worker node here. It shows everything that's going on, uh, the containers that are inside that, um, whether it had a scan uh, of the entire uh, systems and the containers and when it was last done. Shows me what kind of uh, risks I have going on. Now, this is all brand new and I haven't had the chance really to go deep into how to work with what the information that it's telling you. Again, this is, um, you can see down below, this is, uh, this is version preview one. So this is very new um, and not, um, yeah, it's, it's very new. So we're all uh, just learning this. So the nice thing about inside the containers is if you go to each container, You can see um, on the main note here, if I go to compliance, you can see there's a few, uh, there's a few warnings going on um, by the default rules. It's checking, um, yeah. And then the vulnerabilities, this is what I thought was really neat. With the vulnerabilities, you're getting um, real-time scanning of what's, what's going on on the main hosts as well as the containers inside that. So for example, you have a high vulnerability here that was uh, December 21st. So you can imagine where that probably came from. That's, uh, we all know that's probably what this is going on here. So you click on that and then you can actually open up a white paper and see what, what this is all about and what you need to do to fix it, whether there is a fix even available. And th this, is, this is really handy. So you can do a deep dive with each one of your containers and slowly pick through um, where you need to fix certain pieces of software, whether you need to fix um, update vulnerabilities. It could be um, that you, there isn't, a vulner there isn't um, something available yet, so maybe you need to disable a, a feature. So th this, is, this is really intuitive. I, I thought this is really nice. And um, yeah, and with that, um, does anybody have any questions? Um, that's, that's about it for me.